And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. It's an invitation. Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life. How? Freely. God is inviting us. He wants us to make that choice out of, out of the dictates of our heart. So Revelation's final issues revolve around worship and freedom of conscience. We don't find that in the second beast. Revelation 13, 12, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. Now if the first beast is the papacy, did that power allow people to choose or did it persecute and destroy and kill anyone who came against it? It was a persecuting power. So this beast, the United States that we're seeing the, the uh, prophecy point to, is going to exercise all the power of the first beast and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship. So here is a forced worship, one that is demanded, dictated, to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now what would cause this turn? What would make the United States, which is founded on this principle of freedom, the freedom to worship God by the dictate of your own heart, what would cause such a change to take place in this country? Well, we're already beginning to see some of the birth pangs of this change take place, aren't we? We're already beginning to see some of the freedoms that we so freely enjoyed before 9-11 taken away. And so it could be terrorism to even a greater level. It could be economic ruin. It could be natural disasters. Or it could be all of the above. But one thing's for sure, the prophecy has been right on the money up to this point. And we know without a shadow of a doubt as God is proving that He is the one who pronounces the end from the beginning, that this prophecy will come true. That this lamb-like beast that started out is going to speak as a dragon. So He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. That's Revelation 15. And so now we're talking about how it's going to create an image to the beast. So, clue number seven is that this country will form an image to the beast. Now, what does that mean? We don't need to guess. We don't need to speculate. The Bible gives us the answer to that. If you remember when we studied Daniel, in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. How many remember that? We studied that many times. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And in that dream, he sees these metals that make up this image. Now, he was not able to interpret this dream, but Daniel, of course, through the power of God, was given the ability to interpret that dream for Nebuchadnezzar. And we found that each one of those metals represented a kingdom, didn't we? Was Nebuchadnezzar happy with the interpretation that Daniel gave? No. Why not? He yeah, his kingdom wasn't going to last forever, was it? Which one was his kingdom out of all those? The first one, the one made of gold, right? And so Nebuchadnezzar wasn't very happy when he found out that there was going to be another kingdom that would succeed his and that his kingdom would not last forever. As you move through Daniel, you find that what he did with that vision was that he decided that he was going to create his own image, didn't he? And what did that image look like? Do you remember? It was all gold. You remember that? He came up and said, I defy that image. I'm going to create my own image and I'm going to make it all gold. Now what would that represent? Obviously, if his kingdom is gold and the one he, he creates this image that's all gold, what he's trying to say is, my kingdom is going to last forever. But it's interesting to note, as we look at this kingdom, or these, uh, this video, can you see the image in the background there? As you look at that image that's the gold, the silver, and the brass, and so on, You've got Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Were any of these kingdoms for God's people? Or were they all against God's people? They were all against God's people. You could almost say that this image in its totality represents a persecutor of God's people, doesn't it? Babylon, that first kingdom, the one that's represented by the gold, is the kingdom that captured Jerusalem. It's the one that destroyed Jerusalem. And so Babylon, this gold here, 
is the one that destroyed or captured Jerusalem. Now, I thought that was interesting. As I was preparing this message, I was just thinking and praying, God, what, what is meant by the fact that this, in Revelation, that this country will make an image to the beast? And what clues are you giving us in Daniel? Because Daniel is the one that unlocked the mysteries of Revelation 13, part 1 for us, isn't it? And so we need to dig deeper into Daniel, and I'm thinking and praying, God, what is it that you're trying to say about this extremely close parallel about making an image that Nebuchadnezzar did? Is this image exactly the same as this image? No. What Nebuchadnezzar did was he took a prominent characteristic of this image to form this image. He took a characteristic that represented this image, but this is not exactly the same as this image, is it? It's not exactly the same. What he did was he took a prominent characteristic, one that he liked, that represented this one. And he made his image according to that. Now that's going to be important as we move on. Just remember that. And so if this image represents the persecution of God's people, this image ref reflects, if you will, something that was very prominent about that persecution. And we know as the story went on that the king made a law, didn't he? He enforced and made a law that said that everyone was to bow down to the image that he had made. And we know that, thank God, there were three Hebrew boys that stood tall. And they said, King, we will not bow down to your image. They didn't even have to be careful in the fact of answering him. They said, we will not bow down to that image. Was God with them in their decision? Yes, He was. And we find that through that fire, God was present in that fire. Now that's an amazing story because as you read Revelation 13, almost to the T, the exact same thing is going to happen again. The United States Constitution guarantees liberty and freedom. Amendment number one states, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. But as this prophecy is pointing out, that Constitution is going to fall, isn't it? It's going to be altered or fall or change, but it's not going to stand the way it stands now. And you already begin to see the rumblings of this combination of America reaching across to grab the hand of the papacy. Revelation 13, 14, And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles. One of those miracles mentioned is the, the calling down of fire out of heaven. When can you think uh, another time in the Bible where fire is called down of heaven? Elijah, Elijah that's right. And so fire, in that instance, we could say represented God's acceptance, if you will, of a sacrifice that was made. And actually, there's, there's several times where fire comes down from heaven and devours a sacrifice. And so that fire would then represent God's acceptance or God's involvement, if you will, in what was happening at that time. If fire has come down from heaven in other parts of the Bible, which clearly represents God's acceptance of a sacrifice that is made then we can say in Revelation 13 that these miracles and this fire that comes down from heaven is Satan's way of trying to get the world to believe that God is behind what is happening. These miracles and this fire from heaven, this false revival, if you will, is part of Satan's plan to deceive the whole world. Let me read the verse again. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So what is that image? Well, in Daniel chapter 7, we're told that this little horn would think to change times and laws. To think to change God's times and laws. Some translations actually say, think to change God's laws that are about time. There's only one law in God's Ten Commandments, that is about time. Which one is that? The Fourth Commandment. Thou shalt keep the Sabbath day. It is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Not the Sabbath of the Jews. Not a Sabbath that was done away with when Jesus was resurrected from the dead. It's the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. God says, I changeth not. 
His law is perfect. There would be no reason for a change in that law. 